Good evening, church family. If you would, turn in your Bibles with me uh, to the Gospel of John, his 11th chapter. John's Gospel, the 11th chapter. Brothers and sisters, I don't deserve to be up here. And I am, and I say that as a, a sinner forgiven, a minister fallible, a young man terrified, <laughs> etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but perhaps most importantly, as a brother in Christ that is looking out upon many loving faces that have tolerated my stumbling steps in, in this calling that God has on my life. As, as small and insignificant as that life is, it is what he has desired to do with me. And I thank you for your, for your patience in the many years that, that we've been together. And so I just wanted to say thank you and let you all know that I never take for granted the, the blessing and the the privilege and the responsibility of, of stepping behind this sacred desk to share your, his word with, with all of you. John chapter 11, and we'll be beginning in verse 17. If you all would, out of reverence for the reading of the word of the Lord, please stand. <clears throat> and Brother John writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him, but Mary stayed at the house. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, he who comes into the world. When she had said this, she went away and called Mary her sister, saying secretly, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and was coming to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and consoling her, when they saw that Mary got up quickly and went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. And said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews were saying, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man also from dying? So Jesus, again, being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said it, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. 
The man who had died came forth bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Therefore many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he had done believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. Heavenly Father, I pray that you bless the reading of your word and the reception of it within sinful human hearts. But Lord, hearts, many of which in this room are willing to have the seed of your truth planted that it might grow into righteousness and salvation, dear Lord. I thank you for this, your church family. I pray that you would bless them for their patience with me. Lord, let us turn our hearts and our minds to the, to the specter that is in front of all of us eventually, namely the specter of death. Lord, help us to approach it from a, a, a worldview infused by your good news, by your gospel found in salvation offered in none other than your son, Jesus. And it is in his name alone that we pray this evening. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Thank you, church. You may be seated. <clears throat> It must be said and admitted this evening that it seems that a, a season of the death angel has come across our church, across the life of our church, has it not? That the death angel has visited uh, with uh, distressing frequency, amen? And we are, and it is a sign, we are in, in a sinful world, we, we are not special in terms of the, the processes that happen to these physical bodies. You know, being a Christian does certainly, certainly does not spare from death. But I want us, in light of just what has transpired in, over the past weeks within our church family, to, to take a fresh look, to take a, a hard, sincere, but yet extremely hopeful look at death tonight, if you all do, would, would, don't mind and would spare, and would uh, pardon me. So, let's look at the ver first ten verses again closely and clearly. So, when Jesus came, he found that he, Lazarus, had been, already been in the tomb four days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him, but Mary stayed at the house. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. Okay, so we have, the, we have the opening act in, in, this, in this drama, in this, in this course of events, very familiar to all of us who have been born again for a long period of time. What is, if, if we were to boil down into the most simple biblical worldview terms possible. You know, what, what could we say has, has happened here? If death has happened, biblically speaking, what has, ha what has happened? All right, and, and for that, we can, we can look no farther uh, than the old Jewish tradition in Ecclesiastes of the, the body returning to the earth uh, as it was and the spirit returning to the Lord who gave it. I'm reading, paraphrasing uh, from Ecclesiastes, the concluding chapter, uh, chapter 12, verse 7. But also there is an eternal perspective to what has temporally happened. In verse 14, for God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. The conclusion when all has been heard is, fear God and keep his commandments. This applies to every person. Okay, quite simply, the, the temporary separating of the spirit body union. I mean, that's the, that's the most concise, simple, biblically informed way that I can use to describe death. Are there other descriptions that our world offers 
Oh, certainly. You know, the, the nihilistic vanishing into nothingness that the, that the atheistic existentialist would like us to believe, or not believe, as it were, you know, et cetera. And, and then other various and sundry uh, things, but at its very base, it is the separation of the soul from the body with both returning to their respective destinations. And I say that temporarily. We obviously know that with including and, and plugging in a firm doctrine, biblical doctrine of the resurrection, that body's not going to stay in the dust. But I'm getting ahead of myself just a little bit there. Okay. Where does Martha's, this, this resurrection hope that she speaks of in verse 24, where, where, you know, where does this come from? Well, largely and specifically from, once again, the Old Testament, namely some passages uh, like Daniel 12.2, where, where Daniel prophetically speaks of, of, of those being called forth from the dust, you know, to sing a new song, etc., etc., etc. So this, but the, the resurrection that she speaks of is what we would call, you know, more theologically informed people, the general resurrection, the resurrection of all. And I, while that, that is a truth, I, does, is that where Jesus leaves the question? No. It isn't, is it? Jesus, in this instance, with her brother lying dead in the grave, he, does not, he doesn't leave the discussion here at, at the Old Testament limited version of, of, the, of Daniel's prophetic general re resurrection. Isn't it ironic as well, in, in, in kind of a, Oh, I don't know. I, I hate to use the word juvenile, but in, in a sort of a spiritually immature way, isn't it ironic that in the midst of this scenario, Martha all of a sudden decides to just give Jesus a, 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 a theological treatise on what resurrection is? Any of you find that, find that, find that just ironic? Here, here is the, the man who is the way, the truth, and the life standing right before her. I mean, God incarnate standing before her, and she is trying to give Jesus a, a little short mini treatise on, on, on the Old Testament hope of resurrection. Interesting, isn't it? You know, the, the, the Lord, we don't have fi you know, food to feed all these masses. I'm the bread of life, right? I'm the vine. Etc. You see what I'm saying? The, the, the worldly perspective that is limited. Martha, Martha's blinders are completely and utterly uh, wrapped around, wrapped upon her at, at this point. She's speaking biblically, but not thinking biblically, so to speak. Is she not applying it to herself? Well, Jesus brings it home, just as with the woman on the well, he, he brings things straight to her front door by saying in verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Kind of like Jesus asking the, the apostles, the disciples, who then, Peter, do you say that I am? Church family, you realize this, this question of death and, and resurrection ultimately all, always boils down to you. It ultimately always comes to your front doorstep. Tied in, with, tied in with salvation and the lordship of Christ and all these other things that we as Christians are familiar with. Okay? It's, if, if all we have is just this general hope in the resurrection on the last day, church family, I have news for you. All the bodies are coming out of the grave. Lost, saved, kick, kick it in gear with me a little bit. Am I right? I mean, the, the, the sheep and the goats, the, that great white throne judgment, the, the, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want to wait for that. I can't afford my soul. My eternal soul can't afford to wait for that. And yours can't either. And Lazarus's couldn't either. And Mary's couldn't. And Martha's couldn't. It's not what Christ came for. He came that we have, might have life and life more abundant that so, so that the person believing in him will live even if he dies. You see the importance of the, that qualifying clause, even if? 
becoming a Christian is, is not about getting your deliverance from death. We're all going to die, whether Christian or, or lost person in these pews right now. You realize that. That's the first truth. We are all going to die, inevitably, physically, right? Experience the body-soul separation. Whether, whether our, we uh, put faith in, in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior or not. And second, tr- second truth, we are going to experience a resurrection. The, qu- the question with that is, what resurrection will it be? The resurrection of the believers that we're all familiar with from such passages as 1 Corinthians 15 and, and uh, 1 Thessalonians 4? Or just the calling to a judgment seat? We must consider these things, Amen. Look at verse 33. Actually, I'll start in verse 28. When she had said this, when, she, when Martha had given basically her confessional confession of faith, she goes away and calls Mary, her sister, saying secretly, the teacher is here and is calling for you. I'm reading from verse 28. And when Mary heard this, she got up quickly and was coming to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, namely Bethany, we're speaking of, but was still in the place uh, where Mar- Martha met him, unnamed place, unremarkable in the, in the narrative. And then the Jews who were, who were with her in the house and consoling her, when they saw that Mary got up quickly and went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. <coughs> Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. I mean, all verse, listen to verse 32, almost verbatim, initial, unprompted response with, with, with her sister's admonition in verse 21. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Every time I read these two sisters uh, just virtually echoing one another in their, in their second-class conditional sentences, you know, if, if then, oh, if only you were here, then this tragedy wouldn't have happened. I'm always reminded of, of the account of the centurion uh, and, and his deceased daughter. That, Lord, if, if only you had been there, gotten there in time, my daughter wouldn't have died. Well, what, what is, what's significant about space, you know, geographic, geospatial limitations with an omnipresent God? Any at all? I see a lot of shaking heads and amen to every one of you. You're saying there, there, is, no, there is no limitation. All right? Where's the limitation? In our human thinking about what our God is actually like. Amen? Does it, does it really matter that Jesus was not there in Bethany four days prior whenever Lazarus was gasping his last breaths? No. Does it matter that brothers and sisters of ours whom we sat beside and sang beside and, and went to and, and, and laughed and cried together in Sunday school lessons are now lying in, in, in the cold ground? Does that matter in the space of, of eternity and, and within the context of, of what we know was their professed faith? Our professed faith? It shouldn't. It shouldn't. We as Christians, when considering that, that final door, that final transition, leaving this, leaving this earth and the, these, these temporal bounds, should have a bold, confident, I say stare, a, a bold and confident gaze. A gaze born from faith and hope in a God who transcends and has transcended that door that stands before us. All right, and I'm, still, I'm getting ahead of myself already again, all right? But back to verse 31. Mary speaking, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. That, that remarkable, unprompted, virtually uh, identical uh, verbal echo of, of despairing faith, faith under attack. Verse 33, when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, 
he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. Many of you are probably aware that, that it was customary in, in, in antiquitous and still within, with the Orthodox Jews, still customary to hire uh, professional mourning, I, I, there's only no real way other to put it than this, professional mourning crews. Whenever there is a death in the family or a death in the community, they hire, hired, and still hire, professional mourning crews to come and, and bewail the event to its appropriate level of what, whatever you want to put, uh, of excitement, all right? Uh, it was actually even, even prescribed in some of the rabbinic writings to hire at least um, two flute players and, and a crier, a, a, a wailing woman. Okay? I, I guess there was, there was a prescription for Jewish uh, mourning, of, mourning of death. All right? Well, Mary and Martha, we know they were, they were well off by reputation. Uh, independent woman with women, with a house of their own, uh, business women. And a tomb, which w in the textual description is the more elaborate uh, tomb, such as Nicodemus had, uh, cut into the rock with a stone as a door. That was the, that was the more luxurious type, as opposed to just the straight straight down pit that we would you know, be more familiar with. Okay, so there is most likely a an extremely large cacophony going on. I mean, a uh, you know, wailing party. Right, so and nothing unusual, uh, but but imagine Jesus stepping into this as as the Lord of life and death, and we and we begin in this second act of in in this second stage of the of the the textual progression to wonder what is Jesus thinking and what is Jesus feeling. We know some John gives us some of what Jesus is feeling, and I'll, I'll touch on that. We don't know much of what he is thinking except in terms of his thoughts between his heavenly Father and himself. But I submit to all of you, that's most important for us. How does Jesus think and deal with death? Specifically, Lazarus is here. Because the way he deals with Lazarus here, in terms of his, he, him as, as the incarnate son, and the Heavenly Father, whom he is here on earth to glorify, and the unchangeable, at least earthly unchangeable reality of what's happened to his friend Lazarus is going to give us a pre-stage for what is going to happen to Jesus a few days later on a hill called Calvary. Amen? So, look with me again. Into the midst of all this weeping and wailing and and flutes blowing, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Jesus, in third, verse 33, looks around and sees all this. He sees the sisters weeping, the, the Jewish party with, with them, the, the visitors, uh, you know, community friends weeping. John says in some rather specific terms, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. I wish to read something about, about this because... You know, the question arises, how, how ex John, what exactly do you mean by deeply moved in spirit? Well, John gives us an idea. He uses a very specific uh, a Greek term, which, which has an, an analogy within the, the animal realm. The term he uses for deeply moved is used elsewhere in ancient Greek writings of animals snorting. Like, like, think of a war steed that is snorting whenever he comes into visual sight of, of his competitor. Of animals snorting, like, whoof, you, you, understand, you understand what I'm saying? Of, of, think in, in human terms of a prize fighter bristling up when he first catches sight of the enemy. It's that kind of... of, of Intense provocation. That might be a good term for it. He was intensely provoked in spirit, in pneumati, in spirit, in, in his spirit. All right. Let me let me read a little bit. A theologian that says it far better than I, Andreas Kolstenberger. He gives a note 
on this, uh, citing some of the some of the ancient uses of this term. Let me find it really quick. This is the meaning of the word. He gives the meaning of the word, and it's only undisputed preceding reference. In other words, the only um, undisputed pre-New Testament secular Greek reference. Okay, it's found in Aeschylus from the sixth century B.C. Uh, in a in a work entitled Seven Against Thebes. And the way Aeschylus uses it, he refers to mares shown snorting in the bridles with their breath whistling in their nostrils as they brace themselves for the rush upon the enemy. I gave it to you exactly like the ancient Greeks would understand it. And and John chooses this word to describe Jesus' emotional reaction to the state, the present state of what is happening here at this tomb site with those who are still living. Okay. The question is, what, what is, the next question that often comes up and which the commentators debate about ad nauseum is, well, what was Jesus you know, extremely agitated about? Was, it, was, it, was he agitated about the existential reality and, and undefeatability, you know, inevitability of death, as it was represented right there by his good, fr- good friend Lazarus laying in the tomb? Well, I submit that's probably part of it, sure. Um, death being a consequence of the fall, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's never, it, death is something which was alien to the original Genesis 1 and 2 creation, something that doesn't belong. It breaks the heart of God's children. Therefore, it breaks the heart of God in a very real and legitimate se- in sense, and God's Son. Or is he also, or, or is he instead of this, is he is he incensed at the way that the people around are are handling handling this? Um, one one rather insightful theologian suggested that this was Jesus' expression of what Paul writes about in First Thessalonians four, whenever whenever he mentions. Um, people, that we should not be people who weep as if they have no hope. That Jesus saw in all of this cacophony that was going on, right, this, this hired, holy, weeping, wailing party, he saw a complete and utter neglect of the biblical hope of, of true, actual resurrection, of hope beyond the grave. That these people who were professing you know, to, to be believing children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were in fact not acting like, like the lost, like the, like the pagans, like the Gentiles, who had no hope beyond the grave. It was just disappearing into the Greco-pagan uh, abyss. All right. I submit it's probably a little, a little bit of both, but, but I, namely, I see... The, Jesus being ag- angry at the fact that they don't see him for who he is. Because what has he just gotten done telling the sisters? I, mean, I am the resurrection and the life. Listen to me, you know, girls. <laughs> he who believes in me will live even if he dies. There is a spiritual reality beyond what has happened here and, and, and the, the empty physical shell that's left laying in the grave. There's still hope left. Right? Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Spiritually speaking, they, they, have, they have an eternal life guaranteed. Those who believe in me. Do you believe this? And to be faced with people who are sons and daughters of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob with the Messiah literally in their midst, you see how, how frustrating and, and impassionately agonizing that must have been to the Son of God? I mean, he, 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 this, is, this is his children being afflicted, right, in, their, in, the, in the core of their faith by an enemy. And, and I submit to you, Jesus responds accordingly, like the war horse staring his enemy, a, a mortal enemy, in, in, in his face, getting ready to wage war 
on the adversary, on the enemy. I believe that, that is, that is what, what John is depicting Jesus as doing in his spirit, preparing spiritually and emotionally for what is just about to transpire. Verse 36, this is how, this is how the surrounding people at, at the surface see things. Okay, so the Jews were saying, see how he loved him, namely how Jesus loved Lazarus. Oops, excuse me, let me back up. Let me back, I'm, I've skipped ahead a few verses by accident. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. So the Jews were saying, see how he loved him. The verbal, t- boy, the, verse 35, you know, verse 35 is the verse that the, that the Bible drillers love, amen? <laughs> easy, two, ver- two words, easy to memorize. Right? We, all, we all love that verse. Now go, go in your room and... Don't come back out until you memorize one verse of Scripture. Okay, Dad. <laughs> Jesus wept. John, John eleven thirty five. 35, right? <clears throat> well, we all, we all agree there's, there's a, little more, a little more brevity uh, to this verse than, than the, the Bible drill memorization joke. You know? John uses an inceptive aorist verb, which is big words for we could render it Jesus burst into tears. Sudden, sudden rush of action. Okay, it just, I mean, it, it just happens all of a sudden. An aggressive aorist. Okay, he, he, Jesus bursts into tears. I don't, I don't want to say his emotions are overcoming him because I don't like the idea of the son of, son of man ever not being in control of himself. But what I will say is this is the son of man in his most human. Amen. You see, you see what you see what I'm saying? I'm not saying out of control. Because I, I don't I don't believe even whenever he's beaten on the tax collectors with the coat, coat of the cat of nine tails, driving him out of his father's house because zeal for his for his father's house consumed him. He hand, he handled even that in a righteous manner. And we see here the perfect example of the Son of Man righteously grieving righteously being provoked in his spirit and not and and in in a completely different direction than we see with the tax collectors in the temple amen it's a different psychological side of the son of man okay do you realize that 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 because i mean literally of verse 35 we can whenever we take that verse knowing who it is and how it is that he's doing what he's doing, the son, Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, bursting into tears at the, sp- at the spiritual reality of what is before him. You realize that, that it is entirely appropriate to be righteously angry, that for us to be righteously angry at the present reality of death? If he was, we can be as well. Death is not something that Christ took lightly, and we, we don't see him flippantly just saying, ah, oh, take, t- take the stone away. Lazarus, come on. Come on out, kiddo. Do we see that? No. This rips at the very soul fiber of our Savior, church family. Death is an enemy. And Jesus reacts, I believe, psychologically and spiritually in light of that state, of that spiritual state. He is at, at, in, in locked in mortal combat with an adversary of his people. And those who will soon become his church by virtue of his crucifixion and resurrection. Amen? Now, it's, I, now, I believe it's also appropriate to agonize over the future or imminent prospect of our own death. Okay? Jesus certainly did. Amen? It was it, one of the toughest things... For, for me, in, in depicting our Lord and Savior. It was not getting on the makeup, because I had wonderful help in that category. <laughs> I tell you what, you know, commendable help in that category. And, and, not, and not even, yeah, the, cro- uh, yeah, the cross was bad. <laughs> I'll agree with that. Let me take that back. The cross was pretty bad. It was depicting Gethsemane. Because that, I, I just had... You know, in in the, th- the thespian aspect of it, I had to imagine Christ weeping and, and pouring out his heart 
in his high priestly prayer before he became the sacrifice. The priest, I mean, nobody could ever have made Christianity up. A high priest who, him, who him gives himself as the sacrifice, oh yeah, that's a, that's a winning beginning combination for a worldwide religion, amen? Uh, that, that was so difficult to, to try, you know, night after night to depict that in, in a fraction of the level that I'm sure Christ actually went through. I mean, you know, the, the, bl the tears as blood, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I, I tremble when I, when I survey what, what Christ did on the cross for me, okay? It, it is right to be angry at, the, at death's present reality. It's, it's right to, be, to, be, to agonize and, and mourn over its future prospects for ourself or, or its present reality for a dear brother or sister in Christ, okay? But, but it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't stop there, okay? He, Jesus, begins, he, he steps into the foreground and says, these people are going to realize who I am. They've, they've got to. If they don't realize who I am, this yawning chasm of death is, is, the, is, is all that the alternative that there is. You realize that, church family? For millions and billions of people around the world, that if they do not see Jesus as Mary and Martha grow to see him in this episode, the yawning chasm of death is all that there is for them. No hope. Okay, let's continue on in the text. So the Jews were saying, see how he loved him. And yes, we know that's true, but that's only a small, I mean, that's like that's scratching the surface of the spiritual dynamics of what are happening. Amen. But some of them said, Insight, insightful people, thinking people, critical, yeah, but thinking. Let's give them credit. Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man also from dying? Kind of, a, kind of a precursory, uh, preliminary echo of, you know, the priest's words, he saved himself, he saved others, let him, let, let him save himself. As he was day, a few days later gasping on the cross with nails through his hands and his feet. The, 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 the on, uh, but at least an honest skepticism. If he has the power to open the eyes of the blind... Which our, which, our, which our prophets of old have prophesied is what the Messiah would do, then could he have not saved this one as well? The question we know is yes, he could have, Christ could have elected preemptively to save Lazarus from death, to, say, to, to do a miraculous healing from sickness and go on. But I venture to assert to you, church family, they would not have realized and seen the full measure of the glory of God. And I believe that is the point of this whole episode. That the Jewish people there, and even, and even the Gentiles on the outskirts, you know, on the outer fringes of the crowd, could see the glory of God in the face of Christ. You hear me speaking, and you hear echoes of other New Testament passages. I'm glad you do, because I'm just getting them out of my head, all right? When we must see, the lost must see the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus, or else the grave is the, on, is, is the only destination for them, all right? So Jesus, again, being deeply moved within, same, same term once again, being just, just bristled up, in, 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 in being strongly moved, all right, provoked in his spirit, all right, he comes, he comes to the tomb. And now it was a cave and a stone was lying against it. I mean, it, it is sealed. From, in terms of the earthly perspective, the deal is done. The story is over and the book is closed, right? In terms of Ecclesiastes, the silver cord is broken 
the, the, the potter's wheel has been smashed, et cetera, et cetera, all those other familiar analogies from, from the, the 12th chapter of Ecclesiastes. Okay? And Jesus says, remove the stone. And Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead four days. Do I understand why she objected to this? No, I don't. Other than at this point, to just say, it takes Lazarus walking out of that tomb, I guess, ultimately to believe for her. Okay? Jesus said to her, did I? And, and, and it's, that seems to be Jesus, almost Jesus' implicit sentiment in his response to her gentle objection. Right? Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? And that's, and, and that's enough to silence her um, to the point of, okay, Lord, I'm going to listen and learn. Amen? You will see the glory of God, that implicit promise. So they removed the stone. They obeyed. In, sp in spite of all the, 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 you know, the ridiculous absurdity of it all, they removed the stone. I mean, for us, we, we would say either this is just this is crass um, um, rudeness, you know, uh, some traveling showman that, that, that's, that's playing with the hearts of two rich women, right? Or, or, or it's a madman just, you know, playing games in his mind, right? But we have, we have the, rest, the rest of the text. Let me hop back up here. I keep wandering down because I, 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 I love preaching this. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, and I believe these words that he prays are the clearest indication to us of how God and how perceives death and how we should perceive the present reality of death. Okay, To, to this day, from Lazarus' day to ours, he prays to his Heavenly Father, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. He had, already, he had already asked permission for this of his Heavenly Father. In that, in that silent heart-to-heart -heart communication, between the obedient son and, and, and the approving father, right? The permission had already been requested and granted. Amen. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Here's, here's the problem. No one else had heard. I said heart to heart because there's no, re there's no recorded request. You know, Heavenly Father, please grant that this child of yours be raised from the grave. We don't hear anything like that. Okay. Heart to heart. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but because of the people, because of the crowd standing around, I said it. Literally, I verbalized it. Put it into words that earthly ears could hear. For what purpose? So that they may believe that you sent me. What did Jesus struggle with more than almost anything else in his earthly ministry? Getting people to see him, right? To open their eyes and see him for who he really was. The son of David. The promised one. The Messiah. Meshiach. The, you know, the, the anointed one. The, the one that was promised. All right? Not just some traveling showman that could do miraculous tricks, okay? Not not just you know some charlatan that could that that claimed so to speak to walk on the water and and somewhere out in the north of, of Capernaum supposedly feed five thousand men at one sitting. You, you, you know you, we're familiar with all the skeptics' stories, right? And and the twistings of of the truth. Seeing him for who he really was, the promised one. It's the, it's the same situation here, church family, okay. in the specter of death. Adult, in our, you know, adult Jewish, four-day-old, stinking death. Hopeless, the book is closed, death. What does Jesus have, who is Jesus in light of this? If, he's, if he is anything less, church family, than the Son of God, you realize that you and I, of all people, are to be, to be just pitied and despised, as Paul writes later. 
if the ending of this had been was written any other way, you realize we'd be without hope. But we have hope, amen. So that they may believe that you sent me, that what the Son is doing is, is not glorifying himself, glorifying his Father who sent him, okay, according to the promise of the prophets of old, okay? When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The man who had died came forth, hallelujah, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. I mean, they're, they're, they're completely commensurate with everything we understand about first century Jewish funerals, the way a dead man would have been wrapped. Lazarus was wrapped just exactly, exactly that way. And yes, it was Lazarus. His sisters could verify all his community friends there in Bethany and even in Jerusalem at large. This wasn't, this wasn't done in a corner. All right, we remember Paul having to say that elsewhere to accusers of the gospel. You know, this wasn't, these things were not accomplished in a corner. They were in Jerusalem, you know, in the neighboring environs with, with adult people who could verify that these things happened to them or happened to their friends, all right? Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Therefore many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he had done believed in him. And then this, we always, I hate to include it, but verse 46. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. This morning... In, uh, in, in Drew Johnson's Sunday school class, he, he, made, a, he made a statement that, st that stuck with me because my mind obviously was on what I was going to preach uh, tonight as well. We're, we're in Acts chapter 5 in his class, and, looking at, and, and right now in Acts 5, we're looking at the apostolic arrest and trial, or at least hearing, of, of the 12 disciples in front of the Sanhedrin court. You know, it, it's the second one after, after Peter and John have been hauled in and, and had their little conference uh, with, with the Sanhedrin, and then they go back and they take all the other, all the other ten and, and go back to the temple and keep preaching about Jesus. Well, all twelve of them get pulled before there. And Drew asked a question, you know, what, what, what causes, you know, uneducated, humble, poor men like this of, of no repute to, to, to do this, to stand up in the face of Roman endorsed Judaic or, or you know legalistic orthodoxy. Now he didn't put it in those big of words. I mean, he'd be like, I'm putting them in my words to flesh out the larger context. And Drew's laughing, he's chuckling, saying, Mitch, quit using those big words. Whatever. His words are, they caught a fresh view of a glorious God. And that'll preach, Brother Drew. They they caught a fresh view of a glorious God right, along with the indwelling of the, of, the, of the unspeakably powerful Holy Spirit, giving them there in that, in that, in, in that hostile setting words that they didn't, didn't prepare on their own with rabbinic study, you know, with, with, with religious study. No, Peter just stood up boldly and said, we are here, we, we, we cannot stop preaching what we've been given. We cannot, we cannot, Obey you rather than obey God. Jehovah. Amen. They had a view of a glorious God. And church family, in light of, of all the, the sadness that is, has swept over our, our congregation in the past days and weeks, I want us, to, to each and every one of us, to remember that we should not be living as those who have no hope. Amen? We have a Savior who, just in, in, a, in a few days from uttering these words, Lazarus, come forth, unwrap him, take the wrappings off of him, send, let, send him back home, you know, to, to enjoy the shalom at home, you know. In a few days, this same gentle, passionate rabbi this, this healer of the, of the ill, this, this feeder of the hungry, right? This, this 
resurrector of the dead is himself going to go to a cross as, as a, in, an, in an ultimate high priestly sacrifice for the children, the, the, the sheep of his father's pasture. Do you realize that? Let me, let me read one more thing uh, from, from Kostenberger. When we lift up the name of Jesus to, in, in a 21st century scientifically hostile or at least skeptical setting, you know, philosophically, you know, milieued and boiled down kind of relativism, all right, what we are not lifting up when we lift up the name of Jesus is, is we are not lifting up some mystical neoplatonic God who stands far beyond the harsh realities endured by those trapped within a frail mortality, you know, speaking of us, but rather he is a deity who sheds tears, who feels anger, and who dares to look through the dark threshold of a place which he himself will have to enter. The dark threshold of death's door. He was not content to just bristle up like some mighty warrior from the days of David and Solomon and, and go, you know, and, and, and beat the tar out of, out of death on behalf of somebody else. You see what I'm saying? Jesus didn't rely on Lazarus for his glory. Jesus simply glorified the Father and the Father glorified the Son in turn. And part of, that glor part of that glorifying of the Father that the Son did was obeyed His Heavenly Father's will to the point of, of passing, of, of stepping over that dark threshold of death Himself through, through a death more, more excruciating and sacrificial and horrifying than anything any of us have ever seen or, or, or depicted. But He did it for love of you and, my, of you and me. And, so the, and that the Father, that we might see the glory of the Father. Do you realize that? But there's only one place where we can see that glory. Truly, truly depicted. Not without being, uh, oh, what's the word? Counterfeit. Or any, you know, uh, good, good monetary analogy to use. It's in the face of Jesus as, as God's Son our Savior, who demonstrated that through all of his life's work and, and ultimately and completely in the work of his death, in a, in a resurrection from the grave. No one else speaking him out of that grave, but rising of his own volition as, as, as evidence of his perfect, uh, accepted sinless sacrifice before the Heavenly Father. Our brothers and sisters have laid down in the dust of this earth holding on to that faith. Was that good enough for them? Is that good enough for us? Well, I submit to you all it is. Amen? Look, look with me once again. You don't have to turn there. I want to close just with the words that Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians. And just listen, this will be our, our my, this is my sermonic doxology, my closing. But we, but, and I'll even paraphrase it, church family, I do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe, if First Baptist Church believes that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this, and I, and I, I revert to Paul's you know, third person, for this we say to you <clears throat> by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. 
then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always, always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Stand with me, church family. We'll be closed in prayer. Heavenly Father, we, I thank you this evening for the unspeakable hope that is found in no one other than your Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus the Messiah. Lord, I thank you for John's faithful testimony of, the, of the, the love and the passion that Jesus exhibited in staring death in the face for a friend. <coughs> but Lord, even uh, the, the far greater culmination is pages, literally pages later, whenever you're, that this same Jesus goes himself into the dark, past the dark threshold of death. And emerges finally and fully victorious. And Lord, we know, we know that this enemy is this enemy we call death is, is not yet extinguished. But, but we Lord, we know the end of that story as well, for you tell us that the last enemy that will be abolished is death. So in the meantime, Lord, let us live victoriously as, as, as those who have been redeemed, who are your, child, or your children and, and forever we are. And Lord, we, we deeply grieve and miss those of our brothers and sisters who have gone on before. But Lord, let us be about the business the very real, very confident spiritual business of comforting one another with these words that there is hope beyond the grave through the resurrection of your son. <coughs> and in the day of our resurrection, Lord, may we be found working and ready. And these things I pray in Jesus' name and for him. For his people. Amen.